our next well, we guest on today's Big Ten Radio Eat, Drink, and Be Merry show is filmmaker Elizabeth Carroll, and she's joining us to talk about her documentary, Diana Kennedy, Nothing Fancy, and it is a fantastic watch. I didn't know about the life of Diana Kennedy, and um, mm-hmm. man, I want to go hang out with her. She is like the leading expert on Mexican cuisine, and we used to live in Mexico, so this really took us home, and uh, Diana is the author of nine acclaimed cookbooks. She's a two-time James Beard Award winner, and she is also called the Julia Child of Mexico, and she likes to be called the Mick Jagger of Mexican cuisine instead. So <laughs> She's so cool. You- Go to the website at dianakennedymovie.com. And welcome, Elizabeth. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, it is great to have you on the show. My gosh, what a cool documentary. And I, I, I know you've got you know a career in filmmaking and, and working in film, but this is like your first feature documentary, right? Yeah, it was. Wow. Wow. And, and you're filming her, well, good Diana. Job. Yeah, she's spunky, man. She'll tell you, right? <laughs> or wrong, right? She, she yeah, was, there was there. She was she was not gentle. That's for sure. But well, we we somehow we somehow made it work. Thank God. Oh, I love this. And so your production company is Honey Waters. Tell us about that because now, as soon as I heard that, I was like, okay, do you like wine? <laughs> I I love wine. First of all. Um, yeah, I've been really, um, you know, the impetus for honey water and originally was because I was, um, really falling in love with Mexico as a country personally. Mm-hmm. And I, I became really interested in, um, the production of mezcal and mm-hmm. learning about the way that that process works and just how beautifully, you know, ancient it is, and it's almost like a spiritual process, and the families pass it down, you know, from generation to generation, and I've, I always really admired, um, you know, all the people who took the time to teach, um, just to teach me and to teach other people about how that process works. Um, so honey water is, uh, you know, the English version of agua de miel, which is, you know, water of honey in Spanish, mm. um, which is sort of another word for derivatives of the agave plant. Mm. Um, So things that can be produced that way. So that, that was sort of the original connection point that I had um, to Mexico was just my obsession with agave plants and and what they were capable of. So that's how I created the name. But then, you know, the, the hope for the, for the production company was to make films about food and drink Um, that can have an impact on people and, you know, all the way from food culture to food politics. Ah, Mm. oh, that's important because I thought that was, by the way, uh, Nancy and I both bowed down to the agave. We're, we're, yeah, (laughs) right on. (laughs) And that's because we're to our heart as well. And I have to say, even when we lived there, um, you know, because we were starting our magazine and we were there, we don't live anywhere now. We travel full time documenting oh, awesome. parks and destinations across the country. So we eat, drink, and be merry everywhere we go. That's why right now we're in Colorado. Um, we're in Florence, so the capital. Cool. Yeah, we're in the capital of Antiques, or the empty capital of Colorado. Uh, but we just came back from the wine country. Had no idea that there was such phenomenal wines in Colorado. It's just one of those joys. It's when amazing. You, you know, yeah, that's like honey water. But Mexico, it when we lived there, we were there – we started the magazine in 97 back in print days and we were there right before that and still travel back and forth when we started. And it was really cool because they would take you like the restaurants, they were really open to showing you what they were doing and how they cooked. And I, I mm-hmm. saw that with Diana that she, they, they were open with her, but she would also tell them like when, you know, when we were in Mexico, all of a sudden Burger King was there and Pizza Hut's and all these. And we're like, no, but, yeah. no. And she was kind of like, like, uh. like, like, no to them as well. Like, don't use coloring and don't use the chemicals. Make it real. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's, yeah, she's, she's very strict with her moral approach to food in general. And I think that her watching Mexico change and alter through the, you know, industrialization Mm -hmm. over, over the many decades that she's been there. I think it's, it must've been difficult for her to, 
to notice that, you know, things went from one version, which was probably, you know, what we think of as organic today is like just more expensive at the grocery store. But the reality of organic at that time was that they didn't even have access to the chemicals that we Mm -hmm. became so accustomed to being part of our food system in the U S. Um, so, you know, stuff was not stuff, stuff was naturally organic. It didn't, you know, it didn't have, nobody was using those things because it wasn't part of the, it wasn't part of that system. Mm. Exactly. Kind of like the South of France, you know, when you, when you think about that purity and, yeah, it, it, we used to live in Kenya and South Africa, and it was like that. And then it, you started feeling the changes oh, wow. later, you know. So it's kind of like, yeah. God, it, it's, it's, you guys are so, such global, such globetrotters. I'm so jealous. Yeah, yeah, it's good food. It's awesome. the best way to find wine. But, like, I'm jealous about mm-hmm. you hanging out with Diana. Nancy and I both were watching this. <laughs> and it, just, it was such she's a great so cool. I know. I love what she, she's doing she and, and really the sustainability. Cool. How did you first decide, like, hey, I want to do this? How did this whole thing even become, you know, the, the documentary? Yeah, Nothing it fancy. was It was a very it was a very serendipitous occurrence in my life. Um, I was living in, in Austin, where I, I'm back living now. I'm from here originally, Austin, Texas. Um, oh, cool. But, you know, I moved around. I lived in San Francisco. I lived in New York. But now I'm back again. But anyway, I was I was here at that time when I first came across Diana on Wikipedia one day and I was looking to do a project on women in Mexico and sort of the matriarch, the matriarchal structure of the way Hmm. that food traditions are passed down um, throughout history. I was curious about the history of it, but I also was mostly curious about sort of the contemporary approach to passing down those traditions. Like how does that education work in modern day? Um, Hmm. So that's what I was looking for originally. And I was looking for, you know, Mexican women to interview. Um, I wasn't really Mm. looking for, you know, a white British woman uh, because (laughs) I didn't even know. I didn't know about her. And that was so when I found her on the Internet, I was like, how do I not know about this? How do how do we not know about this person? She seems so legitimate and she has such a a uh, wealth of knowledge and she's so smart and she's so accomplished. And, um, you know, it's just interesting to me that she wasn't sort of more of a household name or at least in the food world. You know, I was somebody who had been studying food pretty, pretty steadily for a while. And, you know, the fact that I hadn't really heard of her, that I, I wasn't aware of her work was confusing to me. Um, mm. So that was kind of the first thing. And I was like, God, well, I, I have to interview her. I would love to have her be part of this project. Um, but how do I find her? Where is she? Like, you know, does she email? She lives in the middle of nowhere in Mexico, as far as I know. And I don't know how to even go about getting in touch with this person. So I kind of gave up on it. And I was like, oh, well, you know, maybe later, maybe someday. And then I left the coffee shop where I was. I went downtown to this bookstore in Austin called Book People. Uh, which I love and Mm. but I I never you know I don't go there that much it was a total fluke that I even went there that day I just happened you know it was like a whim so I went in to try to find a book about Oaxacan food and I pulled into the parking lot like half an hour later and I looked at the marquee and it said book signing with Diana Kennedy tomorrow no way dude cool (laughs) yeah (laughs) Sorry, I well, calling you a dude, but you know what I mean. That's just one of those cool. like goosebump yeah. moments. No, wow, for sure. It was, yeah. And I've, you know, I've had a few interestingly serendipitous moments in my life, but this was by far the the most intense That's one. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. It was. So then, yeah. So I kind of like laughed. I was like, "Are you kidding me? Like this is crazy." Yeah. I can't believe this is happening. It just in that moment it became obvious that there was like something else Mm -hmm. going on you know it was like I don't even this is crazy so I went inside that day and I was like I'm sorry like you guys don't understand how crazy this is for me but is this really happening this is really happening right like it's not canceled and they were like yeah yeah here's you know here's the email address for her publicist like go ahead and write an email you can set up an interview with her for tomorrow and I was just like oh okay it was just I mean that was the easiest Wow. Method of meeting somebody I've ever had in my life. But the joke is, the joke that I have is that that was the only easy part about this entire process, <laughs> uh, was finding her. Um, 
but yeah, it was sort of magical. It was just like, it was, Mm. it was bizarre and magical. And so I, you know, wrote this email to, you know, this person who I guess was connected to her and uh, you know, in the email, I was kind of like, Hey, you know, would you be willing to do a short interview with me for this, you know, different project that I'm doing this broader project? Um, and, you know, no pressure, but I would love to have your voice be part of this thing. So I send that off. I don't hear anything back. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever. Maybe she didn't get it. And I spend the whole next day watching YouTube interviews with her, trying to like strategize how to, you know, talk to her. Mm. And then I went into the event the next day and I walk in and I'm walking in a little bit early and I look to my right and Diana's walking in at the exact same time. Cool. And I was like, Oh my God. And I was really nervous to talk to her. And so I approached her and I was like, Hey Diana, I'm Elizabeth. And she turns around and she goes, Oh yes. The older woman who wants to make the film about me. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's a film and about her, like, not just the bigger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I like, love this. That the other the other that's, joke is that like oh. it, it was her idea technically, um, yeah, because I didn't even think, I didn't even know that was going to be an option. You know, like I had no idea she would ever be even open to that, much so, less suggesting it. But that's so British. Um, that's well, so British. Yeah, she was. She's a she's a straight shooter, man. And I wow. think at that point, you know, she was she was ninety one, and she was like ready to have some people pay attention to her in that kind mm. of way. You know, I think that. There's a part of her personality, you know, I do think that she sort of has this, you know, interestingly dichotomous personality of like, you know, nothing fancy. She is, mm. she, you know, she, she'll throw on whatever and go down to the market and focus on the, the real issues. But then the other half the time, she's fabulous. She's listening to the opera. She's eating foie gras. She's putting mm. on Donna Karen and, you know, going to the whatever dinner, you know, she, she has this very fabulous sort of chic part of her personality. So I think she, she knew that she had, you know, some fire that needed to be shared with the world. I, That's awesome. I, I love it too, because, you know, she's at what Michelle Khan where she has, you know, her, I was like, it's her cooking compound, you know, but it's all about the sustainability and understanding the plants and, you know, doing the walks through the gardens. And I think that is really cool about the sustainability part and, it, it, you know, watching that and it seems that that she wants, she wants what she has done to continue. To and I think the, yeah. the documentary you've done is like carried her torch. We did yeah. an interview, I think was like at least 10, 12 years ago. And it was the couple of authors wrote about a lady called Clementine Paddleford. And I had no idea about this lady, but she turned out to be the mm-hmm. first food writer. And she flew, and she was, I think she was writing oh, wow. for the New York Times or something. And she's the first American food writer, especially a woman. For, like, this is before Bourdain days and all of that, man. And she ended up, you know, flying because she was interested in food. And she went into farming communities, kind of like where we are today, and just went in and sat on the farm table and looked at how they cooked. And she was a spitfire. And mm-hmm. I, I, I'm just, I'm bringing this up because I think she should be your next subject. <laughs> but she kind of, her story yeah. kind of aligns with, with Diana's two different countries, but this serious passion for something and really the story of really following your passion. I love that. She, the sustainability part and the passion for food, those two passions, I think, and they go hand in hand. Yeah. I, I, I love that story. Yeah what she's done. Tell me again, what's the last name of Clementine what? Paddleford, like a river paddle, paddle and then Ford, okay. like yeah, the yeah, car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, look her up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, she, yeah, because she it really reminds me of Joy Adamson a lot. She's, hmm. um, she looks like uh, a, she, well, yeah, she a, does in a way, but it's her mannerisms and how um, she just her her stick to itiveness and her this is the way it is there is no other way it's my way or the highway kind of no I know what I'm talking about and you should listen kind of right. attitude and and when I were for Joy I was like holy crap <laughs> well, well I, I just well, want to back up for those who don't Joy Adamson is yeah. um the lady who um was, was help her and her husband George Adamson were out in Kenya. Um, with lions and Elsa the lion born free that's that's 
uh, Joy and George's legacy, and George all went mm-hmm. off and did his own thing, but Joy Adamson is, is the lady with Hell for the Lion, and that's who Nancy worked for when we moved to Kenya. So that's, she, as soon as the documentary started, we went, oh my God, it's Joy. It's Joy. So she has that yes. look of wow. intense intensity, and, and, and the whole, that stick, that this is my way or the highway Everything. kind of attitude comes yes. from doing Knowing. it. It doesn't, it's not egotistical. It's a, it's a, no, I, I've done it. And she drove all over Mexico on her own. Whereas when we lived there, people thought we were nuts. I, I, I thought it was cool, <laughs> but I mean, right. did, when, yeah, I mean, cause she really didn't care. She just went. Yep. Exactly. It, wow. It's that same personality of I'm going to do this and I really don't need anybody else. And um, not that they dislike anybody or anything. They're just so driven to do something yeah. they believe in that it, and then you can hang around or not, but they're going to do it no matter what. Right. And, and yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. Me too. Yeah. I think that that's something that I've always been just really compelled by in, mm. you know, and I think that I'm, I'm definitely drawn to female subjects mm. who demonstrate that kind of, that kind of power and unwillingness to, you know, conform or to, you know, yeah. do something that's expected of a woman, whether it's a 1950s housewife ideal or whether it's in 2020, you know, we, mm-hmm. we have the same sorts of, you know, different versions of the same expectations of us at every turn. And I think that, you know, women who like from the get go from a very young age were never even going to pretend to, you know, um, sort of just go along with those pretenses. Hmm. Yeah. Like Joe used to send me into the city market to buy the food. And the first time I went to the city market, I was like, Oh God, (laughs) I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know the fruits and vegetables over here. And the whole way it was set up, you know, when I was watching the film, I'm like, oh, there she is. She's got her stick and she's going through and she knows exactly what she wants, where to get it. And she was just like, no, it's this, this, that. And it just so, I can almost Mm. smell Kenya Mm. watching that film, like the market, the city market of like, they have tree stumps and they're slicing or chopping with an ax meat on a tree stump. And for mm-hmm. me, I was like, Oh God. And there was a million flies. So I was like, Oh no. And nothing was packaged ever. So it was just, a, it just so brought me home to thing that, that I lived through and Lisa lived through. That was wonderful. Like without pretense, real life, without the packaging, without all the niceties, but still very real and very fresh. There was no preservatives because if it's off, it's off and you could smell it. And that was the end mm. of that. Yeah. Right. But I, w- I wanted to ask you, when you were out filming her, did you go back and forth or did you camp out there for like a month to do the documentary and the we, filming of mm-hmm. her in the markets? That's yeah, so, so cool. we would we would basically have like one annual trip. You know, we the film was, you know, an off and on labor of love effectively for six and a half years. Oh um, wow. Yeah, so I met her in late twenty thirteen and we finished the film and premiered it at um our first festival South by Southwest in um early twenty nineteen. Wow. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it was a long it was a long journey, but you know, a lot of that, you know, it ended up being good because I was able to get a lot more sort of dynamic footage of Diana, which I think, mm-hmm. you know, had we just shot everything in the first year and a half, it would have been fun and great because she was super energetic at that point in her life, but um you know, it would have just been a different film. So I think it was good that we were able to shoot her, you know, year in, year out, at least Hmm. once a year, we would do like a a five to 10 day shoot at her house. Um, And we were able to just sort of check back in with her and see, you know, where she, what was going on, you know, with the year Hmm. having passed all of that. Hmm. Wow. What does she think of it? 
the documentary? Mm, she's kind of unclear about it. I think she didn't really like it at first, and then she decided that she did like it, and then I'm not sure where <laughs> she stands now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got to be odd watching Good yourself, answer. right? You know, but I think yeah, I I I love it. I I just it is. I really I want people everyone to watch it because it takes us back it's to so our cool. roots of food. It teaches yeah. us about Mexican because Mexican food, like when you find one mole and you, it's like a good bottle of wine and then you know the wine's gone. It's one of the most depressing mm-hmm. things on earth. It's like you know you, you can't. It's it's not. This is a a living thing. And it's the same thing with that food. The food over there is incredible. And I love that. I think she's part of peace, you know, bringing people together over food. I, mm-hmm. I just, That's what I, what I love about what you've done with the documentary, that people get to understand Mexico, too, you know, um, especially politically with what's going on in the world. So I think that's really important. Right. How do people get to see it? Yeah, so right now, um, a we are in partnership with 150 independent cinemas around the U.S. Um, so we are mm-hmm. doing what's called a virtual cinema release with them mm-hmm. in place of what would have been, you know, a theatrical release at the actual physical cinemas. But because of the mm-hmm. pandemic, a lot of those cinemas have shifted to a model um, that's virtual cinema releases. Um, mm-hmm. So we were very lucky to be able to sort of maintain a lot of those relationships and actually um, still allow people to to see the film before mm. it's released to the broader public. So right now it's available through a bunch of those channels. And if you go to dianakennedymovie.com, it'll geotrack your location automatically to the closest cinema to you um, that's showing the film. Oh, um, so cool. I saw that. It happened immediately. I was like, how did you know where I am? Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's a really it's a good system, but um, so yeah, so from there you can rent it um, just for three days, I think it is, it's a, whatever it is, and then um, as of June nineteenth, it'll be available on Apple and Amazon Prime as a broader, wider release. Awesome, awesome! So this cool. is so exciting, you know. And then you yeah. also got to interview Alice Waters, Jose Andres, uh, Rick Bayless, yeah, Gabrielle. Mm-hmm. I mean. How was that? That had to be pretty cool. It was incredible. Oh, my God. It Mm. was a dream come true. I mean, because I was, you know, before I met Diana back in 2013, I was, you know, I was, I still am obsessed with food. But I was, you know, at that point, you know, people like Alice Waters and Jose Andres were were idols to me. And they, they remain so, for sure. But it was like, you know, to imagining being able to meet them, being able to, incorporate mm-hmm. them in a project I was making. I mean, if if you told me in 2012 that that was going to happen, I would have told you you yeah. were crazy. Um, yeah. But it was so humbling. And so I was just so honored to spend time with those people because they're brilliant. I mean, Jose just is like an electrifying person to be around. And I think he's so, so brilliant. And so, um, you know, the work that he's committed himself to and what he does every day with, with World Central Kitchen and mm-hmm. all of the other things that he's involved mm. with, you know, he, he is a person who is really creating food justice in real time yeah. and utilizing his platform as, you know, as a, for policy, for food policy, you know, and this is like, you know, this is the work that a lot of people miss when we're celebrating the culture of different foods and the things that we love to eat and drink and like all those things are great and I'm super supportive of them. But I think that food policy and food access and, um, you know, making sure that people have enough to eat period, I Mm -hmm. think is, is essential, especially at a time when, you know, somewhere between the pandemic and the protests and climate change, Mm -hmm. we're only going to see an increased need for emergency um, you know, food access. Yeah. So I think that moving in the direction of someone like Jose is is what a lot organizations should be focusing on. Mm. And that that goes back to uh, Diana's uh, place, her ranch. She's solar powered, right? But then, and I was I was looking at this because I remember seeing these when when we used to live in Anza Braco <laughs> in the yeah. desert in Southern California. Um, there was this. Um, it was, it was connected to the Brego, Anza Brego Desert State Park. They had 
this academy, like a, a desert institute that you would go take all these classes about petroglyphs and all of this stuff and flowers and, you know, bighorn sheep and all that. But they had this thing yeah. about solar cooking in the desert. Mm-hmm. And I remember yep. going to something and it looked like, it looked like you're going to beam up. Okay. So it's like, <laughs> move over, Scotty, <laughs> here we come. And I saw that in the documentary. Was that her like solar oven thingy? There was like a round, it yes, looks like exactly. a big antenna. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, Jose Andres sent her that as a gift. Wow, it was See, it he, was a gift from Jose. Oh, That's awesome. When I saw that, I was like, "She's so smart to be able to cook, you know, by solar." It is. I mean, we did a radio show the other day in Colorado at a Vista and Vineyards bed and breakfast, and they're completely solar powered. It was so cool to be able to say. We're solo powering our show today, you know, to be able to do that. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, so I think that's when you really look at cool. these emergency camps to do it through solar power, it's going to be the way it goes too. not just, okay, we're going to barbecue everything, right. you know, having yeah. been in wildfires, totally. you don't, that's the last thing you want to do is set another fire. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. At those kind of camps. So the solar part, I, I, I'm so excited about that. So is she turning it into a school, like into like a foundation or a school? Well, I think at this point, you know, Diana's, she's 97 years old. So she's, you know, she makes jokes about being completely unwilling to go beyond a hundred years old. So I think at this point, you know, she's, she's making preparations for the end of her life. Um, Yeah. Mm. And so she's not, you know, sort of in the active motion mode that she was in in her early 90s, mm. which is funny to be able to say because most of us, you know, probably won't be so lucky to to see that decade of our lives. But she, you know, she was definitely making, you know, taking action to keep teaching people throughout her 90s. And then, um, you know, I think that um, at this point, she is just sort of hanging out and and just and just kind of making sure that all of the all the loose ends of her estate are tied up and um so i think that she has a really good uh crew of people who she trusts um who have been you know connected to her and part of her life for a really long time and know the house and they know the estate and they know her ranch and everything and and they know her wishes so i think that what what from what I understand, um, they're trying to find a buyer who will, you know, kind of retain and preserve all the things about it that it can be a museum, hopefully a culinary education center. Um, but a lot of that oh. stuff sort of remains it remains unknown at this point. But I guess we'll 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 have to find out. Yeah, that would, hmm. that would be so awesome to keep it and kind of be like a culinary institute but also the sustainable part of it you know because it goes hand in hand so what's next oh, yeah, for definitely. you what are you working on now um yeah, yeah so I think that there's definitely going to be um you know a, a continued uh theme of food in my in my work um so I'm very interested in exploring sort of the nature of the American food system and getting a little bit deeper into uh, the history of that and um, helping people understand, you know, through the medium of documentary, um, you know, how it all got to be this way and sort of maybe, you know, that can ignite people's brains on how they wish for it to be in the future. Mm. I think that's a great idea because people are kind of wondering where do we go from here? You know, right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, I have to go back to education, man. That's the the one thing. Education mm-hmm. is the it, it, it's key mm-hmm. to how society moves on. Mm-hmm. It has yeah. to be education. Yeah, documentaries really do it. I think mm-hmm. documentaries. I mean, oh, that yeah. is one of the most powerful tools that we have. You know. I just want yeah, the I younger agree. generation to see it as much as possible. But especially when you, you're, I, I'm, I honestly, I don't like to say the word lucky, but I mean, how cool was it mm. 
that you got to film her oh, while was, she was alive. I was incredibly you know? lucky. I was, yeah, I, I have yeah. no, uh, I have no qualms about admitting that I got, yeah, I got really lucky with this project for sure. Did she make you cook? Did she like get your hands <laughs> dirty in the kitchen? <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I don't think she would have trusted me with that at all. Um, I was, you know, <laughs> we, we had the job to do that was sort of hands off, but, um, but yeah, I certainly watched and when, when she did the boot camp uh, with all the culinary students, you know, mm. I'm, I'm a cook at home, but, a lot of people in Q and A's are like, "Well, you must just be an amazing cook." And it's like, "Well, no, um, <laughs> I'm a fine, I'm a fine cook. I'm an okay cook, but I, you know, I was more focused on making the film than than cooking the food for the last few years." That sounds like my yeah, driving. Of I, I drive us across the country and around everywhere, but don't put me on a mountaintop, that, or I always get everyone lost. <laughs> And not only get myself lost, I get everybody else connected with me lost. That's my, my yeah. talent. But, you know, please keep us posted as you do more films and documentaries. Really awesome, awesome documentary. Nancy and I both were just like, this is so cool. This is, you know, what mm-hmm. a wonderful story. And, uh, again, carrying that torch on. And I think that's the other power of documentaries is you're carrying the torch for people a lot of times. Uh, you know, people that, you know, yeah, yeah, need to have that torch carried. So uh, we're all visual totally. and we're all living on computers now. <laughs> so I'm glad it's going to open. Yeah. I'm glad, it's you know, you're still able to work with the independent cinemas. I think that's also really cool that, you know, there's a plan B, you know, that we've all had to go to, plan B and C uh, with this COVID thing and, you know, uh, right. theaters. Right, exactly. And, yeah, so I'm I'm really glad you're able to do that, but also that will be uh, streaming in, on Amazon and, and iTunes or Apple, I should say, as well. Uh, everyone, again, the website is dianakennedymovie.com. And uh, your other website, for everyone to keep up with you, what's that one? It's honeywaterfilms.com. Oh, okay. Very easy. There it is, everyone. Well, thanks so much for yeah. joining us. It's a real pleasure. We're going to close the show with a song dedicated to you and to Diana. It's called Mexican Sunrises. This is from uh, the acclaimed guitarist Pepino Di Agostino. It's from his new album, <laughs> Conexion. And you can go to his website, Pepino Di Agostino. And I'm probably not saying it right. You know, he did give me an Italian <laughs> lesson when he was on our show. And if you want to hear that, go to blendradioandtv.com. But thanks so much, Elizabeth, for joining us. And everyone, Thank you'll you see us so much. Thank you. It's so thank cool to have you, you on. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Lisa and Nancy. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you again for having me. Have a great night. You, you too. too. Take care. Here it is, everyone. Mexican Sunrises. We'll be back on Friday with our Toast to Parks and the Arts show. Here it is. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.